live stream is on. Is on. Is on. Hello, Global Theater. My name is Jerry Fielka. It's April 25, 2021. Thank you, Clinton, for helping us. You are the grandmaster of it all. Thank you, Clinton. And it is an honor and a pleasure to be here with Sam Amadon. Is that the right way to pronounce your last name? Absolutely correct. Sam, what's the best thing for a human being? The best thing for a human being is beautiful water, fresh water. Wow. I never had that answer. That is good. Beautiful and fresh water. That beautiful is water is the beautiful feeling of life. Oh, God. That is such a, an amazing answer. What's your favorite form of information? How it comes into you? Oh, my goodness. Well, I would have to say a deep late night car ride conversation. Oh my God. That's as that's as heavy as P. Adam Sydney said, pillow talk. <laughs> pillow talk. I love that. Yeah. I love that too. Yeah. yeah, you can't quite beat pillow talk, but deep late night car. Yeah, because that's what the you know, karaoke is quite a phenomenon. Because you know, to sit in a car with, like with Sam and go, okay, Sam, let's let's have you sing your greatest hits. And you got to do it stripped down, stripped and down, dark, right there. So you you don't always see each other. You're just you know both driving along the road, and um, and it's an incredible time to listen to music with somebody else, and and then but also when the music is off and you're just on the open road at night, you know people will speak the deep their deep truths. Yeah. That's the epiphanies. You know, Rachel Carson pretty much helped us all learn ecology and love Mother Nature. She had these epiphanies with the fireflies. That's how wow. she got to know this. I'm going to teach you people to treat Mother Nature nice because fireflies talk to me. You know. Wow. <laughs> so, Sam, why do you think humans collect or gather information? I think humans are are wandering around and they they that's a great question they're curious and they they walk around and it's like a it's like there's the garden of flowers and uh and and insects but then there's the garden of mad wild beautiful ideas and yeah. That's a beautiful garden. And then once you start to realize that, once you stop being scared of it, like, um, cause sometimes it's intimidating and you get worried that you're gonna be, you know, thought of as stupid or misunder, like that you have to understand everything. But once yeah. you stop worrying about understanding everything, everything becomes interesting. Yeah, really well put. Uh, McLuhan said, understanding is not having a point of view. We think we got, oh, I like that. I don't like that. He's saying, no, understanding is getting wow. the big picture. So that was really good that you have the garden flowers and the wild mad ideas too. Now, Sam, do you think that he, he, gathering information, collecting information is more innate or more invented? I know it's both and it depends. All my more or either or questions are like that. It. It's sort of, yeah. Wow, that's a hard one. I mean, <clears throat> it's hard because for me, like information is almost addictive and I probably should have to sometimes, because I just always, I love it. It's always fast. Everything, everything is interesting to me, but that's not always productive, right? So then you have to try to quiet the mind. So I think it is innate. I think it's innate. And I think, yeah. but then maybe there's a lower innate space, which is quieter and you have to kind of dig down there sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, that's what words limit us. It's definitely layered. That was well done. Do thoughts create emotions? Absolutely. <laughs> You're certain on that one. <laughs> Absolutely thoughts create emotions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's the thing when you see somebody talking and if they're talking about something emotional, maybe they're on the verge of tears. You know, there's that thing where they have to actually say, like when they actually try and say the words that are the truest thing they're feeling, that's when they start crying, right? Like they're on the verge of tears, but it's when they actually say what it is that they really are feeling in that moment. You see that the, the emotion well up when the thought comes verbalized. 
Wow. I don't know what I think until I fill in the blank. Oh, man. Until I uh, absentmindedly play my banjo for a half an hour while thinking about something else. Ah, <laughs> that's good. Absentmindedly. <laughs> Dude, that's the, be the best music is when you're absentminded, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's definitely, it's not, it's just when, you know, that's, that's when the thoughts come to you. It's when you're just sitting there strumming the banjo. Yeah, I, watch I do that. Basketball on TV or something. Yeah. Oh, you mean you watch basketball on TV and play the banjo? Yeah, yeah. And then the thoughts come all flowing through you. Yeah, that's that's me on my bicycle. I take three bike rides a day, and it's like, man, oh, yeah. that that turning of the wheel, something about movement in here. No, humans. that's huge. Shooting hoops in the in the garage, you know, shooting shooting hoops. In the and the and the basketball court next to the house. That's like a classic. That's the wow. Classic. Just on your that, own, on your as you're saying, like not not playing basketball, just like on your own yeah. shooting hoops. Very yeah. meditative. Yeah. Uh, do you more pursue happiness or more pursue meaning? Wow. Meaning. Yeah. I yeah. mean, but the problem is, if you're unhappy. The meaning, like that's for me, the def, the, the I, I, I think I notice whether or not I'm unhappy through whether things are compelling to me or not. Yeah, like I don't. Well, the, so, yeah, so I don't know. That makes it complicated, I guess. Yeah, but the thing is, is that by studying Vic, Victor Frankl's book uh, "Man's yeah. Search for Meaning," it's that meaning lasts, and happiness doesn't necessarily last. So again, they're so hard to. All these uh, words, because we invent words. I mean, the bottom line one, which I forgot was your observations of humans. Are they more feeling beings or more thinking beings? I know it both and it depends, but just your general observation. Are they more heart, or more head? I think more, more heart. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. But that's the thing. It's funny because all my other answers have probably been more on the side of the meaning thought space but i think people are more feeling and then they find the thoughts around to make it make sense yeah um does the brain more detect consciousness or create consciousness like is consciousness there bubbling away and we're detecting it or are we actually creating it well Man, consciousness. I studied years of philosophy and it didn't get me any closer to the answer of this question. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't help at all. It just confused me more and more. And um, all I had to do is I was try supposed to imagine being a bat and how impossible it was. And um, so consciousness, when there's one conscious, I feel like a lot of the time I'm not very conscious. You know, I'm just, uh, I'm yeah. just bubbling along. Um, I think that... Um, I think it takes some work. It takes effort. And, but maybe not. Maybe it doesn't. I think consciousness is, I think we create it. We create it. Yeah. I'd Good. fall on the side of create. Yeah. But who, just really brief, who, when you were studying philosophy in the college you were studying? Yeah. Who, who were you sort of leaning towards that sort of as per, uh, you know, remained any of the big philosophers or movements. That I I think that um, I loved. Um, well, I had this feeling because I was listening to tons of John Coltrane also in college, and I had yeah. a very strong feeling that uh, Coltrane was working on the same concepts in a musical space that the philosophers were working on in a you know brain space. Yeah. And I don't know yeah. why, what I, I don't really know what I meant by that even, but I remember having a very strong feeling just, and, and I think the people that I loved, I had a beautiful professor, a old woman, Elfie Raymond, who had been, uh, who was Transylvanian and she, um, she taught Plato, but she believed that Plato, that everybody who interpreted him after was wrong and only she understood him correctly. And then wow. he built, that only Plato really understood the shifting nature of life and the shifting aspects of reality. And that afterwards, everybody took Plato's ideas and calcified them. 
but she believed she really gave us a glimpse into the shifting nature of of thought and of reality and the other person <clears throat> i did like although i'm never quite sure i felt like i got the bottom of him was wittgenstein and who i did for about a year and then i found out right at the end of that year that my grandfather had been the in the only american class that met that studied with wittgenstein he came to cornell in the 50s or whatever about oh, 40s and um and my grandfather was in that class but wittgenstein he also had a good way of talk of like in terms of consciousness i mean he loved language obviously so he believed yeah. it all lived inside language and i loved his just odd and playful way of looking at things yeah, really well put. Wittgenstein or Wittgenstein? <laughs> <laughs> I have like no young, idea. Yeah, like young, young Frankenstein. Exactly. Um, yeah. So what's faster, speed of thought or speed of life? Oh, my goodness. Definitely thought. No, yeah. I would say, I would say uh, Alan Holdsworth. Ah! <laughs> 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 that is a great answer. Yeah, none of these, Sam, it's an honor and a pleasure because none of these an, uh, questions have right or wrong answers, but that one you got right. So, <laughs> so the great poet Audre Lorde said, you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Yvonne Rayner responded, you can if you expose the tools. What new tool do you suggest? Beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, I'm sure I don't know because I'm, you know, I'm not the young, young child I used to be, but, but I suppose, but I think that, um, you know, I think the farther you look back, the, the farther you look back, the, the, you know, the more interesting and compelling things are not to go. I didn't intend to go back to here, right here, but if thinking back to this same woman who taught Plato, she saw, showed us things like Heraclitus, you know, believed that everything was changing or Parmenides who believed that everything was the same. And we read some of the phrases of those guys. And, you know, if you read some of that stuff, it's super weird and strange. Or for me, I think Herman Melville, like he's the answer to everything. And the confidence man, the Herman Melville, the confidence man, one sentence of that, that'll unlock all kinds of stuff. Or Nat Coleman, who you, you know, Skies of America, which you once taught yeah. me about. Yeah. All of these people who think about things in mysterious ways and you can go, you know, they're in, they all have their own, their own systems. And some yeah, of those systems like, are very great. Yeah. That's a good word systems. And it's like standing on the, standing on the shoulders of giants. And then how do you see beyond them? So, you know, like Ornette with you go, what you just said was important because most people don't know Ornette came out of King Curtis, which is just yakety right. yak facts, but in a way, but you know, and then how do you transform it? You know, yes. in, in, you know, it's like, how do you, uh, play Ornette uh, traveled with him? He had, he toured with a minstrel show with you know, magicians and bearded ladies and, and, and blackface and stuff. And then he was practicing all his free jazz, you know, in between doing minstrel gigs. Like he was coming out of all, I know, beautiful. And, and then he turned, he turned it all into this incredible, magical, futuristic language. It's amazing. Did you get that from an Ornette book or how, where'd yes. you get that in? An yeah. amazing recent book by Maria Golia, who was part of the, um, uh, the Caravan of Dreams in Fort Worth, which is the same people who did Biosphere 2, the Synergists. And yeah. the, she's written a biography of Ornette, which is absolutely beautiful. And it talks about the whole world of Fort Worth Set blues saxophone players, King Curtis, and uh, some other guys, um, um, blanking on some of the other, Dewey Redman and Ed Blackwell, and just how that whole thing you're talking about, the link between the blues and R&B and jazz, it was all mixed together for those guys. Wow. What do you worry about when you go to bed at night? Um, oh my goodness. I would close my, I, I have to confess and I don't, I, that I just fall asleep too fast to worry. I, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm a sleeper. I Did worry during the day. I worry at other times, but night is not that time. I just conk out. You could sell millions in the wellness industry teaching I people. I got to out what it is. <laughs> I have to figure out what it is. I don't know what it is. I can, I used to go to, I don't listen to music or anything. I can, I can read one page of one sentence and I conk right out. Yeah, that's good. 
So uh, McLuhan learned from Ezra Pound that artists are the antenna of the race. They're broadcasting the hidden psychic effects of our inventions. You know, artists, musicians, filmmakers. And we can look to the artists to uncover these hidden psychic effects so that we can learn to cope with what we don't like about them. McLuhan's main probe was that we still ignore the hidden psychic effects of our inventions, even though artists can reveal them to us. Why do we ignore them? You know, or why do people ignore them? Right. Um, I think people, I, I think people ignore them. I mean, I don't know. I think the artists, yes, are doing it all the time in weird and beautiful ways. And I think that in the moment, people don't ignore them, you know, at the concert or right after, people will say the most amazing, <clears throat> people who you don't even expect would say something so strange and penetrating about what just happened, you know, who maybe doesn't come from a total cultural, other cultural world will, will respond in such a profound way. So I think when they're, when people are given the chance, you know, they will, they, they, they will, they, they want it, but yeah. there's just so much noise out there, I think, and the, no, the no, you know, the cultural no, detritus and noise and, and stresses of life. And although some of the stresses, then you go to the concert and the concert feels even better because you needed it more. I mean, there's some places I've been to where people are so like, uh, like in some of the Nordic countries and people in Scandinavia where they're doing everything right, you know, how they treat the, and that's good, those, they have a good model. We should all be more like those governments, but, or what, you know, in terms of the systems. But there is a funny thing where, where the concerts can be a bit boring because you don't feel like the people are, there's not, there's no real, they don't really need it. You know, they're just kind of chugging along or whatever. Whereas in, you know, in Eastern Europe or in America or in wherever, it's like people come and you can feel that they need to have, they want, they're excited for something to happen. Amazing. So I yeah. Want it. I think people want it. They want it. Yeah. Well, you you answered it beautifully because I never get that answer that people don't ignore it. That that I'm implying that they do, and because McLuhan said we still ignore it, but I I show one thing that happened once that we'll never forget is I showed some experimental film and someone came up and says I started thinking of my grandmother and like yeah. totally not related, but it was such an amazing epiphany they had because some it opened up some door for them. Beautiful. And so um I I'll say more more quick thing about that. Can I say more? Please, please said, go ahead. I think yeah. that the problem is that people our whole um industry systems send people to the channels that they're supposed to go to. So the experimental people go to the experimental music concert, the country people, you know, the, I'm I'm using the musical framework, but you could apply it yeah. to anything. Yeah. And the more we try and shake those up, because some of the encounters that are the most beautiful are when people are not you know when they go to the other kind of thing and and you know what i mean when they're when they're then then that's when some of those encounters you know happen yeah that's, anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's no that's thing. well put because george clinton the godhead of parliament funkadelic told said i said what kind of music do you like he goes the kind of music that i don't like that ma it makes me upset like why do i like this well, you know because it's hard it. Jump out of your comfort zone. You're yes. totally, yeah. Yeah, I just experienced that. So are are you, wait, did I just ask you that? Are you more afraid of new ideas or old ideas? Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I probably, I'm never somebody who's, it's weird. Like all my heroes are people who were always searching for new stuff. Miles Davis, you know, uh, those kind of people. And, but I've, I've never felt like the, but then because I play traditional music, the beauty of traditional music of playing fiddle to Irish fiddle tunes or old time tunes is the idea that it's not, you don't need to try and innovate it or change it. You just play it. You link up with, and you're connecting to something deep. that's bigger than you. Right. So I think I'm caught in between those two zones. It's either the I love the idea of you know traditional music, and the, it's not about being individualistic and pushing it forward. It's just about playing the tune, nice, you know, playing the tune and engaging with this old thing. 
so I don't know. I'm sorry, I, but I think that I think that my instinct is to be is to be comfortable with old stuff, but then there's a little itch to go somewhere else. I hope. Yeah, yeah, because that hope. PBS, yeah, that PBS thing really laid it out. It's like here's yes. a dude who's traditional, but he's he's playing it like Ornette and Miles seventy. No, I love how the guy goes no Miles seventies funk era. Like that's the era most Miles people go. That is horrible. Yeah, yeah. Right? I've met so many people who think Live Evil is the Godhead album of all time, yeah. and you know, and and I mean, it's rare, but yes. you you find you occasionally find someone and go, oh, that talked to me. Yes. But you know, I was wondering, you know, I I want to get into music in a second, but since we're right here, we'll we'll tangent for a second. Mm. What? Did you hear Joseph Spence or anybody who you consider in the traditional music form that went out in that sense of Ornette or Miles and that nudged you? Or did you just go, I'm playing this and now I heard this and now how do I combine them? It was definitely both like, I mean, yeah, or I mean... Joseph Spence is incredible, and and I think I heard, you know, this. I heard this the weirdness of the traditional music. Like I heard this thing that was the same thing I was hearing, and then of course when I learned more about things like Ornette and Albert Eiler, I learned there was a direct connection. Like, or uh, Charlie Hayden was from the Ozarks and played. Uh, you know, the, the link was actually causal. I, I was just thought I was noticing it, you know, but actually yeah. it was, really, but, um, but there were people, I mean, Henry Flint. Yeah. Uh, who did crazy drone Appalachian mad music, you know, yeah. incredible. And um, Tony Conrad. And then, and then, but, but even for me, like, like if you, the thing is, again, it's kind of goes back to your earlier thing, because if you go to a folk concert and somebody sings a solo acapella ballad, that just seems like normal because it's a folk concert. Yeah. Actually, to stand on stage and sing with only your voice for seven minutes, a song full of murders and betrayals, and like that's quite a weird. Like in another context, that would be considered like a super bizarre performance art project. So the this this ballad singer Almeida Riddle, I just sat down and listened all the way through one of her long ballads yesterday, um, and because I realized I was talking about her a lot, but I hadn't actually listened to her music for a few few months or whatever, and. And you know, it's this very. She has this voice that, um, it's very reedy, and you can you notice all the overtones in her voice because she's holding her notes for a long time, and you actually don't know what word she's saying for a while because you're waiting to hear the consonant at the end to know what yeah. the word was. So you kind of have to remember what the first half of her word was to the to the last half. Like it's a very you know, and but it's like a field recording you know from the Ozarks from the fifties. Yeah. And and you know and then and and she had a beautiful thing which is that you have to get behind the song. So as a oh. and, and you know instead of feeling like you need to express all the emotions in the song, you want to get behind it. And I felt like that was very beautiful and deep. Yeah. So can you conjure up your earliest memory ever or one of them? I definitely have a vivid memory, but it's connected to this tape recording that my parents made of me talking and singing at the age of two and a half. But I remember, I remember, um, you know, seeing my aunts on the sofa and walking upstairs and, but it's kind of a memory of a memory. One of my vivid memories is, uh, is is um, walking on the hospital, following the red line to meet my brother who had just been born, but then the memory disappears when the room opens. And then the other one from that very little age is would be um, a helicopter ride. I took a helicopter ride two days later on my third birthday. And that wow. I remember very well. We flew all over. Wow. I remember is seeing the swimming pools from above. Is is uh, memory more a curse or more a blessing? Well, I think I think it's it's a curse, but it, but it, I mean I mean it's a blessing, but in the fuzzy form that we are given it. Yeah, it's a blessing, but it's a blessing in the the you know the the imperfect fuzziness that we have it as. Yeah, fuzzy is a great word, Sam. That's good. So, can you tell me just briefly? Someone in your immediate family who had an impact on you was like a role model. 
and what specifically was that impact or role model? Uh, you know, what, what was that impact? And then outside your immediate family? Uh, inside, I would say uh, my dad and I, and well, both, I mean, both my parents in many deep ways, but in terms of what you're talking about, I, just in terms of talking about music together, you know, we're listening to music together and the act of listening and convert and analyzing I'm, and 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 again, really, regardless of whether it was something we had any expertise in or not, there we would we would be just trying to figure out what was going on and and uh, an open mindedness towards you know towards that. And uh, then, yeah, outside your immediate family, someone. Well, there have been so many, but I'm going to say you. I'm going to oh. say you because I'm serious. I'll tell the story very quickly that I told before, which is. I met you at this folk, beautiful folk camp met, uh, when I was 18 in 1999, and we talked all week about stuff. And it, I was think I was in this era, you know, it wasn't the era of, the, of now of the internet, right? Like it, knowledge was hard to find, and and to find people that knew about these. And I was searching, but I I would find these, and and we talked all week long. And you at the end, you gave me this index card, which as, as, as I said, I still have. I'm all. When I'm in Vermont next, I'll take a picture of it and send it to you. And you wrote down names that were like talismans, and each name was like this, you know, world of of and and it was Sonny Chirac and the Shags and Harry Parch and and each of these names just opened up like universes and 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 I and I would come back to that card like for years to make sure I hadn't you know to see what else I what hadn't paid attention to the previous time. That was huge, Jerry. And I'm not oh. just saying it because I mean it's it's in my I, I know where it is in my attic. It's in a box. And it oh. was just like it was huge. Sam, um, I always know uh, the interview's going good when one of the the interviewee or the interviewer tears up. So I wow. teared up. <laughs> that was touching. And you know, my favorite is if you're gonna follow Harry Parch, are you willing to burn all your music <laughs> and become a hobo? <laughs> <laughs> That's so you know that. That fast forward to yeah, one go ahead. Brief, brief thing of the last year, which is that um, one of the, the, for my wife, Beth and I, one of the saddest uh, uh, losses of the COVID was, uh, was Hal Wilner. And, oh, yeah. and who, who, especially Beth worked very closely with and, and, but, but, and, and he's somebody who affected my life in many ways that I didn't even realize until after, like I went and saw the movie, Kansas city, the Robert Altman movie when I was a teenager. And it's, the jazz, but also just the use of music in a film blew my mind. Of course, I didn't find out, you know, until much later that that was him. And then, but one of the Hal records that I've listened to the most in the last year is the Mingus tribute album oh, with yeah. Bill Frizzell on guitar, which uses Harry Parch's instruments as the percussion for the whole record. And wow. there's a documentary that's Ray Davies from the Kinks directed. He doesn't appear in it. He just directed a documentary about the making of that album that's on YouTube. And oh my God, I didn't It's know incredible. That. And and it's all, they actually got from the museum, Harry Parch's actual instruments. And it's Mingus's tunes and only Hal's imagination, you know, could have uh, conjured that. And so, but, but, you know, that again, that was from your note card. Oh, that's sweet. Cause one day I was on Venice boardwalk and this guy's playing a, a thumb piano and it's like the size of a kitchen table. And I was like, what the heck? And he goes, oh, yeah, I work with Harry Parch. I'm like, that's the beauty of Ven Venice Boardwalk of the wow. stuff I do. Yeah. But, wow. but uh, what an amazing, you know, that that's like Waits is a, Tom Waits is a Harry Parch beef heart wannabe. And he'd admit it. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> I'll admit it. <laughs> he'd be the first to say it. Totally. So um, did your parents raise you a particular religion? Yeah, definitely. Like they, they're like old, like New England hippie Christian. Yeah. Like it's the old New England church is very simple. And, um, but they, but they, but they didn't, you know, and, and it was very important to them, you know, the singing the hymns and the, and the, you know, the mysterious stories of Jesus and the morality of it. But, 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 you know, but none of the literalness around any of the, uh, you know, just, just the you know the ritual and the stories in the community element was what it was about for them. 
And did did you check out ever? Do you consider yourself practicing that, or did you? I don't consider of... myself practicing it. No, and and I mean, I but I but I'm st I still think of it as part of my. You know, I think you can't ignore when you have that as part of your childhood. And and um, and I, yeah. So I mean, obviously, there's other things I've checked out along the way, and I'm not. I mean, I don't go to church, or and I haven't read. You know, but. Uh, but but you know all the mysterious a, a lot of the tales from there I I love and you know and and of course I sing a lot of Christian folk songs and yeah. and and I think that's a slightly because some people like you know you don't have, some of those songs like there's the Sacred Harp tradition which is this, you know a lot of these hymn singings and the people who sing that music are not necessarily a Christian they are all different religions and or an atheists and stuff but you know a lot of the imagery and emotional stuff and discussions of death that happen in these songs are very eloquent and you know deep and so people come to that those songs and find comfort in them regardless of what their you know background is and um that's kind of my yeah that's kind of my feeling of it do you pray mm -hmm. i don't not consciously no if god exists what do you want god to tell you after you die Oh man, um, <laughs> the 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 never-ending three-on-three basketball game is that way. <laughs> <laughs> that is a cool line. <laughs> the never-ending. <laughs> that is cool. There's going to be hoop in heaven. Thank God. I never realized. Right Shooting Hoop in Heaven. That's the name of my next album. <laughs> okay. Do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? Man. I mean, unquestionably the latter. Definitely the, the second one. But but then what is it if it's not in people? That's the question. Where is it coming? Because it's not some magical force, right? But no. Yeah, definitely. And I, I have to, I don't know why, but I've been reading some, um, well, one of the most um, profound things I've encountered lately is the film Quo Vadis Aida, which is a, re, it's a, it's a, well, it, it, the Academy, are the Academy Awards today? Yeah, tonight, yeah. Nominated for the best foreign film. Not that the, that, not that the Academy Awards matters to anything anywhere, but, but this film is profoundly incredible about the Srebrenica massacre in um, the Bosnian war in the 90s. And then after I saw it, I found out that the director had been part of Bread and Puppet Theater in Vermont in the 90s. And oh, she, yeah. during the war she is, because Peter Schumann went to Sarajevo and did a puppet show during the war there. And she then went to Vermont and, and I went to Bread and Puppet that summer and saw the circus. And there's video of her abstract puppet theater telling of this story when she's 22. And now 25 years later, she's made a, you know, a traditional narrative feature film, but that is film also gives, you know, reading about things like that or the Rwandan genocide and, or obviously the Holocaust, like you really get a sense, you know, there's a scene in this film where it shows how they all have to then live in the community together after the survivors and the perpetrators, and they go back to being normal people, all of them, yeah. you know, and so clearly, you know, and, and so it's clearly, but yeah, I don't know where, but then where does it come from? That's the question, right? No, dude, the Oscars matter because I, I, I'm an experimental film guy, and people go, "You like the Oscars? It's like my <laughs> Super Bowl. It's a, it, or it's like, a, it's called a guilty pleasure." But yeah, Sam, yeah, yeah. When you win your Academy Award for you know scoring, you know her second film or whatever, you get up <laughs> there and you got to do this. You got to, you got a moment to talk to the most, the biggest audience in the world live, True. and True. then you go. Go listen to the shags. You know, yeah. you say something like nobody ever does that. They go, thank God. And I, yeah. You know, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of Sophie Coppola, but she goes, I want to thank an Antonioni. Like yeah, nobody yeah, totally. thinks like their influences really, you know. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I always think, what would you say? Like, uh, I'll shout you know, out to the shags. Yeah, yeah. Don't Miles ever. Right. <laughs> and then kids let just go. Whew, and totally. then that, you know. True. Okay. So 
How do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? So I'll set this up with a few modern thinkers' thoughts. Alan Watts said, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. JFK said, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. And Fellini says, I need an enemy. So it's a lot of thoughts. The wow. basic question is, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But first, how would you react to the first one? Alan Watts, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. That's probably my first instinct. That's my first instinct, but it's not always right because I think sometimes it's just, tr that's a way of sort of not facing your own feelings. Or for me, that's what that sort of, that might yeah. not be what he meant, but you know, it's yeah. sort of, I, my instinct is that I think I'm, or maybe I think I'm doing that one, but actually I'm just not, you know, because my instinct as a person has always been, you know, I'm very conflict averse. And so it's been very hard and important as an adult to learn how to, you know, say how I'm feeling to people, even if it's uncomfortable. I'm still, I'm sure not great at it, but, you know, I got better than I was before. So, you know, so um, that's, yeah. So I think that I, I, I like my instinct is the first one, but I think I have yeah. to make sure that I'm not trying to kind of sneak around my other instinct, <laughs> which is yeah. for which is which is conflict averse but um i think you can you know get a three and three game going and put them on your team <laughs> put them on your same team there's no i was thinking about this i was playing you know my basketball game is all different kinds of people from in east london and they're from all over different countries and who know you know all different whatever political persuasions but when they're on your their team you just got to work play you know you got to win the game man Wow, that's heavy. On what occasion do you lie? Oh my goodness, the um, that's a great. Um, oh, I can't. I I'm the. I remember. <laughs> I I I'll answer that by way of a story, which is that I once had this conversation at a at a barbecue in Texas, and I was like, for some reason, I'm really good at. I was saying I was making conversation with people I didn't know. And I said something like, I'm really good at lying at the border, like at borders. I, I, I'm a terrible liar in my life. And yet somehow I'm like totally. And then the woman, I was like, so what do you do for a living? And she's like, I'm a border patrol agent. Ah. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was joking. I didn't mean that at all. <laughs> Scrupulously honest. Well, it's, uh, it's actually from Marcel Proust and back to Tom Waits' answer is, I didn't know I needed an occasion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but but what I I use I asked that usually later, but I interjected it because it, what you just said before that remind me is is someone said, well, I don't want to lie. Most people say, well, they they'll admit they lie. It's a it's right. probably innate in us to lie. But they go, the I don't like lying to myself. Uh, that you know when you conflict yourself, like you yeah. knew this inside you, and then yes. that's that conflict like how do i juggle because you know yeah 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 <clears throat> james joyce was the first projectionist in dublin over a hundred years ago the volta cinema he basically checked out he said this wow. is stupid why should i go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when i can go outside and see a real tree <laughs> faulkner years later said sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism Sam, why do we have to recreate things in order to get them? Why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? That's a beautiful question. Beautiful <laughs> question. I got, I have to, I mean, again, I think you're talking to an addict right now. Like I'm an art and music. I'm an art, I'm an addict, right? So I, I mean, I, in my mind, like heaven, the other heaven is just like, con just, you know, which is what I've what we've had this last year in lockdown, which is just like endlessly listening to all the Coltrane, watching all the westerns, you know, reading Arno Schmidt Bottoms Dream and this <laughs> cartel trilogy that I'm reading now. You know, just endless culture art all the time. And yeah. so I, I I have to remind myself to go to break away from it, you know. And then, but it's crucial. I mean, the the most important. Um, 
one of the most uh, biggest years of my life was that I recognized uh, around when I was 23 that I was addicted to listen to headphones. Even if I was going to the shop a block away, I would have headphones on. And um, so I decided to quit listening to music on headphones for a year. Basically quit listening to music except for unless I was home and it was like a conscious activity, right? Yeah. So outside of the house, no music. And I literally felt like I was on drugs for the first four days. Like buildings were moving weird and trees. And I was like, like, because, you know, when you listen, you look down or, you know, you're not really. And obviously, sonically, there's a whole universe out there. It's beautiful. That's the lesson of John Cage. He's like traffic. I like the sound of traffic. It gets louder, it gets quieter, you know. And so, so, um, and every, here's the thing about that. Everything I've done in my life musically came from that year. Oh, I'm serious. I made my first album of songs. You know, all everything that has been the rest of my life since then came from that year. So it must. You, it's, it's you got to do it. Yeah. Did you learn the philosophy of fasting? Because you you did you definitely said one year. Because did you go back to having headphones on the rest of your life? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, so you learned that. Who did you get the philosophy of fasting from? From health food parents, or you know, uh, uh, religion, or some? Yeah, it was how did it? How did that fast come upon you? The idea to fast. Yeah, probably some Kerouac something, or who knows what it might have been. But but that um, but I but also I um, go up to Nova Scotia with various fa family friends and stuff, and in the summers and. You get you you know you learn you're out on the island and there's no electricity out there and um, so you learn from yourself the experience of just like what that feels like and how when you're up there you don't wish you don't wish you were watching a film or right then or whatever. Yeah, you, know? you so, learn the sacredness. I learned that at Swan's Island because they would say, "Here's a compilation two DVD set of all the greatest hits of Swan's, and here's yeah. a pile of all the people." I go, I can't listen to any Swan's Island Sweet Chariot music on any format, it's too sacred of a live event. You gotta be there and in the moment, you yes. Know, you know, Su Susie's partner, uh, Brad, has the history of every recording device ever in the history. He has a lathe to, to do cool. cylinders. He can make cylinders, everything. And this is how brilliant he is as a music historian and a player. I says, Brad, did did recording music ruin music? He goes, yeah. yeah. But he knows he knows what I mean by ruin. Yeah. He knows, you know, he has it all. And and oh, he's right. it's sacred, you know. His friend buys a, a seven inch or a you know, yeah, one yeah, of those yeah. small, 12 inch an eight inch vinyl for twenty thousand dollars. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. It sound, it sounds like one I could buy for a nickel, you know. <laughs> You know, the quality does. But um, what you invoked in me was a quote I sort of uh, reword from the poet Auden. He says, the mystery of art is that we really don't know if it activates or pacifies us. Wow. Because when you said when you said you're an art and music addict, our society deems addiction as a bad thing. Right. Oh, better go to recovery you need a wellness program <laughs> and you know it's like dude that's the best addiction in yes. the world and you don't know if it's activating you or pacifying you I know. so we, we want to believe artists and musicians we want to believe it activates people yes but it might be this whole you know we can't imagine how could elizabeth cotton singing at age 14 have a mm. disservice <laughs> you yeah. know Totally. But, but that's that's great what you're saying. And um, so you you've probably talked about this enough in your past interviews. But so let's skip it. It's basically when did you decide to go, oh, I can do this. So at age two, your parents are such great music teachers. They're already recording you. You were sort of like funneled in. You didn't, did you, okay, let's put it in this term. Did you ever rebel and go, I'm not going to do music. I'm going to go be a basketball star. I mean, did I, you ever fight the well, being funneled into the music world? Well, the, the only moment like that that I remember that is funny is in my early 20s, 
because I the, the thing that I was doing from a small child was playing the fiddle. And when I met you, I was a fiddle player. And that's that was my whole musical identity. And I wasn't really anything else. And so I had all the and the thing is that fiddle for me, because because I had really learned the traditional fiddle style so intensely, I couldn't really play anything else on the violin, right? I couldn't become like a, a rock violinist or something because it just sounded folk, you know? And I, I did yeah. do improvising. I studied, I had an amazing year studying with Leroy Jenkins, who was from the wow. association wow. AACM, you know? And he was beautiful. And we did, you know, a year of free improv stuff or improv and all that kind of stuff. Um, but still it was very much, you know, limited in that way. And so I knew, I, I did know that I didn't want to just play fiddle as a job because I had done that in my childhood so much. And so I would, I and I, and so I did a thing where I took a year around the same time of the headphones year. I also quit being a professional musician, which I had basically been since I was 12 or whatever. Yeah, age twelve. On. And, yeah, and I and I took a I took a day job as a well. I still t I still took like I would play Irish sessions if they called me the day of. I just didn't book my calendar with any folk gigs for that year, and yeah. and I took a day job as a transcriptionist, typing you know oh, nice. typing interviews, and and I think I do think my parents were a little uh, kind of confused. They were like, we gave you these this uh, skills to like not have to be in this system of just doing shitty jobs you know what I mean? like, we like we tell you know why are you like saying no to that but they understand and, and but but for the first time since i was like 12 music and money were totally disconnected because even in my teenage years i was booking gigs for popcorn behavior in my band with thomas and stefan you know and so i was always getting paid for gigs which was very satisfying but at a, at a, at a certain point around age 25 it was profoundly freeing to you know for the first time really yeah. like be going to Brooklyn and playing a gig for 20 bucks or zero bucks with yeah. the crazy, some crazy, you know, indie rock, but with this group stars like fleas or whoever, you know? Yeah. And that, so, so a per paradoxically quitting being a professional music was one of the most, you know, creative. And, yeah. and in some ways that it was, you know, arguably a rebellious move, although not that rebellious. But that's pretty good, Sam. Cause it, the M great McLuhan line is, Carefully make plans, then do the opposite. <laughs> yeah, good luck. You've, you got the balls and encouraged to do that. So I'll just throw in this question I never asked. Frank Zappa says, being in the music business, you have to sell your cock and your balls. So <laughs> from age, <laughs> I just be blown about it. From age 12 on until the today. Do you feel the same? <laughs> Man, well, this is the beautiful thing about coming from the folk world. Because yeah. the that's genius. The 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 thing with the folk scene is they created their own ecology outside of the music industry, right? The world that we met through Swans Island and, and the world of contradance music, you know, it was a, a profoundly egalitarian thing. You know, everybody on stage gets paid the same amount you know, uh, the people who come pay a fair amount and a large percentage of that goes to the musicians. You know, all of these practices that I encountered in New York where, you know, the venue keeps like most of the money and you have to tell which band you're saying so they can decide whether to hire that band back and, you know, and and the whatever, all these different hierarchies that existed, you know, that was nothing I grew up with. So. And and but at the same time, the music industry, of course, has totally crashed, right? And are you there, Jerry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm being totally sorry. I just so the music industry has crashed, and per, uh, funnily enough, it's actually become much more similar to the folk scene, whereas people are now self-releasing on Bandcamp, you know. And it, so the, this music industry, which is much you know a bit reduced compared to what it was a while ago, is actually kind of familiar to me because this is just the whole idea of setting up your own thing and making it work is that's familiar, you know, that's the folk thing. Yeah. You do good too. I love your website. And uh, I love the fact that my friend taught me, everybody says, what's your website? You know, you do your name, Sam Amadon at yes. com. I, do you know what dot com stands for? It stands for communism because there's nothing more communistic than the internet. <laughs> that's right. Than uh, your own website. Yeah, in some ways. I love it. I love it. So uh, a screenwriting teacher told me that a great art or great music is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. 
And Stanley Kubrick says the opposite. Great art or great music, great film is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention play in your creative process? <clears throat> well, I'm. Uh, it's a beautiful question, and it's always interesting to me how when when you hear uh, people talking about their own movies or their you know, their own work, the they they're so bad at judging it, or you know which which of their fi films was the best, and they you know it's always some random one that, but the um. But which maybe they're right. I don't know. But I think I I I I'm not somebody who's able to um, <clears throat> like scheme up a whole structure and then realize that structure. Like like uh, I have friends who can do that. They have an idea, like for an album and a, a musical idea, and they they see it through and they call people that are going to get the sound. I I am much more reliant on accidents and collaboration and you know, just keeping track of stray thoughts as they come by. And I'm very trusting of the overall, you know, the patterns of, you know, not really judging what you're checking out, just follow what's interesting to you, trust how it'll it'll come in handy someday somehow, probably not in the way you expect it, you know, and, and just sort of like seeing where things go. And luckily for me, music is obviously like a profoundly collaborative, collaborative space so you know i'm somebody definitely who follows through accidents and friendships and just sees where things lead yeah that was good i love this line i'm trying to get more control over my spontaneity <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly so duchamp says there's no art without an audience how much when you're writing a song poem or whatever you're writing something of your own mm -hmm. how much are you thinking of the audience before I you're, yeah i i i usually i think i would often i might often be thinking of one or of some specific person in each case you know somebody who i imagine might listen or read or see it and and i mean a lot of stuff comes out of like a lot of things i'll find come from you know because there's certain friends who at certain stages you know, you have a certain feeling where you just, you know, they give, they inspire that in you or whatever. So, I mean, I, you know, I've found, I've made whole songs from like texts that I sent to a particular friend because I just, uh, he, he, I know he has a similar humor to me. And so that in, you know, in dialogue with him, I'll say all these things that I would never say in a vacuum, you know? Right. That was so, good. I, yeah. So, uh, McLuhan says that everything we invent extends some humanness. So clothing extends our skin. Knife and fork extends our teeth. The uh, shutter is an extension of our eyelid. What does the guitar extend for you? What humanness? Man, I think the guitar is like a, it extends, uh, I don't know, maybe all your toes and feet or something. <laughs> <laughs> you really, you got that well because it's so evident. You know, people would say your voice. I mean, of course, you know, no, we know your it. voice has to go above. Your voice is on top, so the the yeah. guitar is sort of you know trundle. Your it's like your carriage or whatever. Well, that's funny. Your voice is on top. Yeah, because you know when I wean John Fushani in my living room right next to here, Love it. he said you have to sing the guitar note. You know, it's got to be like one with your voice, but but I mean, well, it is a good. Guitar player, he's a soloist, so I'm I'm he's an electric guitar player. If that makes sense, because he's singing. Yeah. And I, when he says that, I think of you know, <clears throat> one of the most beautiful sounds in the world, which is Jimi Hendrix. You know, when he yeah. sings and play, what he's oh, yeah. his relationship of his voice to his to the yeah. instrument. I I when you said that, I was imagining my own thing, which is acoustic guitar, which is more creating a you know. A, a, a world of structure around your voice. Yeah, but but Sam, I, I'm loving that because it's evident when the, I ask the question, what humanness does it extend, that there's generally a people answer the evident. And that's fine. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm always after the deeper because this, this neuroscientist poet from Italy who lives in Dublin, I interviewed the other day, I goes, He's a poet. I goes, what what is your writing utensil extend? And he sat there and thought and he goes, my tears. And I was like, oh whoa. <laughs> Great. But <clears throat> your answer also resonates with McLuhan. They say, what does the fit, what does movies, film extend? 
He says, your foot, you're traveling. Amazing. Amazing. And, you know, he right. think, oh, no, memory, vision, right, eye, right. And so, you know. So it's uh, always fun to, to uh, get um, know-it-alls like you to say something that is inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> So um, is it possible for humans to take in information faster, to learn to take in information faster? So I asked Michael Apted, you know, great filmmaker, hmm. third, almost 40 years ago, this question, why do rock video editors feel so obliged to edit fast? And he goes, because we've learned to take in information faster. And then Scorsese says, why well, edit my films faster because of MTV? Because they sped up that whole right. idea of mass editing, even though it was invented in 1920, in the 20s by Abel Gantz in France, but it right. didn't really perpetuate that. So I asked this question with a bias. Is it literally possible for humans to take, to learn to take in information faster, or are we just brainwashed to believe we can? No, I think, you know, what goes up must come down. You know, you can only, you can only take in what you can take in. But that said, uh, you can take it in at whatever pace you want. So uh, two things I've done, experiments I've done with pace recently are, I, I, I listened to Proust, Remembrance of Things Past, at double speed on the and on my audio book. And it was, it was like direct thought transmission from his brain to mine. It cut out the middleman completely. It was fantastic. And on the flip side, I've just yesterday discovered that on YouTube, you can watch videos at whatever, you know, half and double and 12, yeah. whatever speed. So I've been listening to Coltrane, John Coltrane, like the really blistering, you know, modal Coltrane solos at half speed. Oh, my. I was it's, thinking you were going to say, so no. you listen to that double yes. forward and you Coltrane listen to Trane at half. Oh, my and, God. And it, it's so amazing. It's so amazing to close your eyes and follow the solo in this super weird, you know, slow way. It's really profound because his he was just hearing it all, but I can't hear it at that, you know, at that tempo. That's amazing because, you know, the another great fiddler violinist from Swans, Reed Jenkins. And a couple of years ago, I said, uh, what's the uh, industry standard for how long? No, no. I says, if I send you an audio clip or a video clip, how many seconds literally will you give? It doesn't matter who sends it to you. What's your right. sort of, you know, ballpark? Because I said it to students years ago. I says, like, would you listen for 10 seconds? I go, well, now 30. And yeah. so yeah, Reed told me this about three years ago. He says the industry standard is 10 seconds wow. in my 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 industry standard for myself is I'm one second. Well, no, mine is one oh, right. second. Oh, I see. Second, I, go, I can't. I can't listen to this. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. My other friend, which you evoke, my other friend who I want you to meet so bad someday in Missouri, uh, he uh, he listens to everything faster. You know, all YouTube. Right. I says, dude, this clip I'm sending you, please do not listen <laughs> to it. Speed it up. And it doesn't matter because he shifted. That's a new, that's what, right. because what I not listen to train half speed and Proust faster if you can, and it works for you. There's yeah. no rules, you yeah. know. Totally. <laughs> totally. That's great. Okay. So um, what was the motive of the cave artist? Not what Herzog or anthropologists say, but just your intuitive hunch. Right. Man. Well, if I think of storytelling. Yeah. And I I I think of folk tales and storytelling and and just whatever the mysterious company that I feel like it's keeping company. I thought about this during the lockdown because you know what were what were we going to art for for lockdown? And one of the things that I would often go to listening, I was listening to a lot of MF Doom, the rapper, because yeah. it because it was like spending time with somebody, because it was like he was keeping company with you. Something I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but so maybe they wanted to be kept company by some of those animals in there with them. Wow. But you mean MF Doom pre-dying or post? Oh, I this is this the, <clears throat> I listened to him all year. And then at the end of the year, he died. It was, I know, it's great. No, from June. I was listening from June. 
It was especially, wow. actually, especially, no, not June. Like it was especially like, you know, April and May because the language is so rich and yet he yeah. delivers it in such a beautiful, relaxed manner that yeah. it was like, uh, it was just like spending, it was like company and yet it had all the fireworks of, he had this, and he had this line, which, which, which I kept with me for the whole lockdown. He, one of his songs, he says, there's four sides to every story. If these walls could talk, they'd probably still ignore me. Wow. It was so amazing. And I've been thinking about that line. There's four sides to every story. If these walls could talk, they'd probably still ignore me all year long. All that right, is beautiful. Yeah, that yeah, my my friend uh, who also I want you to meet in Austin, Peter Quadrino, he runs the Finnegan's Wake Reading Club there. Cool. His three things are the wake, rap, and baseball. And Love then it. when MF Doom died, he says, this dude is the closest to Finnegan's Wake ever. I and really believe like, that. Yeah. I really believe that strongly. He's the joyce yeah. of our times for sure. Yeah. Slip like what Freudian, your first and last step to playing. So his other line, slip like Freudian, your first last step to playing yourself like accordion. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> He's the greatest one. One okay. thing I like about MF Doom is that all his, all his rhymes are like one long rhyme. Like, you know, different, yeah. some rappers have really different attacks and flows and MF Doom just has one and it just goes through all the songs. And I think it would be really beautiful for somebody to do a book of his lyrics, but not distinguish them by song. Just have it be just a total flow of all the couplets. Anyway, yeah, that's, no, that's my first that, 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 choice. That is really good because, um, uh, you know, that's something you said there I lost, but that that is deep. He, uh, oh, was Freud right is the question I was going to ask you. <laughs> I I um I don't know yet. I haven't read him. I haven't read him yet. I got to read him to find out. Yeah, good. Okay, what's more important, conviction or compromise? Um. Wow, my, that's beautiful. I uh, I think that I think that uh, conviction is more important, but compromise is essential. Is more essential. Yeah. But compromise gets yeah. a bad rap because compromise is just like in art. Compromise is what like like compromise is what makes the art go beyond just the people. Like the whole thing of the idea of a band, you know, the Beatles or, you know, the Shacks or the Stones or, you know, like a band that has a vibe beyond the individuals where when they break up and make solo stuff, it's different. You know, it's, there's something with a band. So the compromise is inherent to that. So I think yeah. it is conviction is the the one that I think compromise is underrated. It's get it gets a bad rap. It's a it's compromise is a deeper and more mysterious and alchemical thing than people. the The word compromise sounds like a disappointment, right? But I think exactly. it has more. It leads to some you know other mysterious thing. No, it's well put because my favorite answer ever was a a welfare lawyer. He wasn't a. He was a lawyer on welfare. <laughs> I, says, I says, what's more important, conviction or compromise? He goes, depends on what you mean by important. <laughs> so he totally shifted the emphasis that yeah. most people. Yeah. So Great. you've accomplished a lot in your life. How do you rate these three elements? Luck, skill, and ambition. What plays first, second, and third role? Uh, I would say... Um... I would say luck, skill, and ambition. <laughs> that way, that, that, that honestly, that would be. I would yeah. say. Well, I have a I have a theory, which is that there's like six or seven things, and four of them will lead to whatever. To, will lead to success. You know, you don't need all six, right? Like, so I think it could. Be, there's like luck, skill, ambition. You know, yeah. uh, timing, and yeah. like infrastructure <laughs> like yeah. your own infrastructure in business in business acumen or whatever right like you need four of them so skill yeah. like like the, the quality might be might be one of those but it might not you know but any you need like a few of those but you don't need yeah. all of them yeah my my uh question used to be because i'm always refining these and i'm always mm. wanting i always want people to comment on the 
form well, and, and tell me about the questions and you know whatever but um i changed that and it was too easy i used to say is ambition based more on fear or joy <laughs> and then i read uh william friedkin said in hollywood nothing there's no skill no no uh luck matters it's all ambition oh that's dark <laughs> <laughs> that's great which is which is similar to maybe music business too or any i mean things, it, all these things because yeah. i mean i think that also you know because skill could mean so many things because you can be skilled and yet when it when it comes along your skill can inhibit you from discovery right like things like ornette or think about people like ornette or obviously the shags being the most extreme and yeah. profound example but um ornette or even bill frizzell you know like bill frizzell tells the story about how he had this idea when he was like in berkeley and he's like oh my god i'm gonna take the harmonic you know uh soloing innovations of paul blay but i'm gonna like apply it to the guitar and then pat metheny came to town and he was like, oops, like that dude just shredded that concept beyond anything oh I will God, ever good. do. And so, and he's like, but it was the best thing that could have happened to me because it sent me down another path, you know? And like, again, like, the, the, you know, skill is such an abstract, like, you know, it could go, it, it can, you can, pe skill can be such a, such a, such a, uh, so it can be crippling. Yeah. That is really good. That's the kind of anecdotes I like to learn. Thank <laughs> <laughs> That's all oh, I know. The one I wanted to say way back that I forgot was you probably know this, but um, Bella Fleck told me he was sitting in his bedroom listening to Doc Watson and his brother was listening to Chick Corea Return to Forever. So he stood in the hallway and went, Great. Hmm, how can I blend these two? <laughs> I says, that's what Charles Ives did sitting in the church, hearing the church music and the marching music. Absolutely. Goes, oh, yeah, absolutely. My very, very last gig before lockdown was doing Charles Ives at, in Netherlands. Nice. I was, I was playing some fifth string quartet, and I was playing the fiddle tunes, and then singing mm -hmm. some, singing some of the hymns as well. Deep yeah, shit. I love. Ives has this somewhere where he's doing Cecil Taylor, and I'm like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah, but but uh, what an amazing. Uh, my friend was the foremost Ives guy in the world. Wow. Till he died, and then when when uh, the Ives people said, okay, go finish this this piece of Ives. It's like, Amazing. you know, it's like, how do you do, you go, I'm going to get into the head that I've studied for so many years. It, it's impossible, but it's right. still worth the try, you know? Right. And so um, T.S. Eliot said that poetry is outing your inner dialogue. What language is your inner dialogue in? Oh, man. It's probably very, um, very boring. <laughs> that is a great answer i've never had that answer that's an adjective that's not a noun that's good no 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 it's a verb sorry very boring <laughs> that's like the guy the guy norman klein i says what's your favorite form of information and he goes honest <laughs> and he is the only one who who answered it Great. With an adjective. I mean, it's so funny how the questions imply. Yes, yes. Like, so we'll leave it at that. What form is your inner consciousness in? <laughs> um, uh, man, what form is your inner consciousness? I can't think too long, otherwise I'll get into a muddle. The, um, <laughs> uh, you know, um, chillin'. Chilling. Wow, that was good. That's like uh, my other uh, one of my other favorite answers is uh, New York experimental filmmaker Abigail Charlie says, "What form is your inner uh, inner dialogue in?" She goes, "I wish I knew." <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Um. So uh, these other experimental people say, like uh, George Banyan Pelly's uh, mantra is, "Ignore yourself." Jonas Mika says. There is no self-expression, but Cecil Taylor sort of nailed it. I'm just a vehicle, and this stuff just comes through me. Mm. So again, this is it depends, and it's it's 
the the question's more based on the more word. Is art making, music making, more self-expression or more you're a vehicle for whatever culture or technology is dominant? Yes. <clears throat> I, I love... Um, Well, again, that's where music is. It, it comes in. Well, it's other art forms too. Because for me, it's really about the trio, the three-on-three -three basketball game. Uh, but no, it's the trio. The, the so that's the thing. It's not just. It's not one person. It's the. It's what happens with, with the encounter. That's why right. I love jazz improvisation. That's why I love uh, traditional, you know, fiddle tune session. You know, for me, that like the trio. It's it's the. The fireworks that occur between the you know between yeah. the human so so for me it's the social language quality like the, yeah. the ornette coleman thing where he talks about in all languages you know and yeah all, all different languages and people say the the quote universal language thing around music which i understand what they mean by that but for me it's much more interesting all the different languages of music and how yeah. you know and they grow beyond the people it's very beautiful like you um, but so yeah, I think it's around the, the the it's around the people with each other. It's the social quality. Yeah. Well put. Can music making, art making, be egoless? Yes, but a little ego shakes things up a bit. <laughs> Good answer, Sam. You are amazing. So you you evoked this. We're going to go into music for a hair now because you invoked it with by bringing in that word language. McLuhan said, "Song is slowed down speech. The reason cultures have different musical taste is ultimately connected to language differences." Any comment on that? And, I, and I'm not saying it because you should agree or not. I'm just I, saying. I get it. No, I think it's different. I think it. I. I, I would love. To, I've no. I mean, it would be great to think more about the languages to music. But I think it's more just that the musicals, the musics, are languages of their own. And yeah. I think they do link in some mysterious way to people's cultures. But I think they, you know, I think they're languages of their own, and they arise and change, and they're not as specific languages you know they're vague or they're more vague in some ways i guess but you know the, i I'm, i love that i fact that when you walk into a irish session for the first time right all the tunes will sound the same to you right it just sounds like people playing fast in d or whatever you know or if you listen to bebop for the first time it sounds the same or you know the first time i listened to james brown i was like all these songs are, there's like only one song i didn't you know and then once you go deep you have to go deeper in to hear all the differences and then eventually, if you're sitting at the Irish session, you know, us, each fiddler, you can hear what county they're from, you know, or whatever, you know, that's the, 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 yeah. the elaborateness of the language. And, and, um, or, you know, or like, uh, even not to go, but like to go back to like, like to early 90s hip hop, where like, I'll be listening, I'll think I get it because it's like a sexual reference or innuendo or whatever. But then I'll look at like some genius annotation and I'll realize like, their reference, or I'll think I'll know it because it's like a mafia movie. They're talking about the Godfather. I know the character from the Godfather. But then it's like that is also referencing a previous song that was about a similar subject, but the style, the rhythm of the rap is referencing some other. So it's to me, it's just like all these weird, you know, that's the beauty of it is like the weird. So it's its own language that grows up. But I wouldn't have anything about it to connection to the land. I think singing and talking are totally different. Yeah, what's more fundamental, language or music? Um, well, probably music. Yeah. I think probably music. Yeah. Well, what you just said, Sam, invokes so many thoughts in me. <laughs> because I got to tell you, for James Brown, uh, Billy Vera's drummer quit his band. He says, I got a job with James Brown. And he went on the road with James Brown for for a year and he came back and he goes how was it he goes it was great i learned that james brown goes to every town finds the coolest musician jams with him and then steals his lick and it's like Amazing. that's why his music is universal <laughs> and it spawned you know king sunny a day they go what'd you listen to growing up james brown <laughs> great that's then, great um, then i saw albert king play once in la and every 
every solo was the same, but it didn't matter. <laughs> it was like, right. God. and then uh, that's why Frank called uh, all that John Adams and Philip Glass and Steve Wright, he called it Looparama music. <laughs> that it, if you listen closely, you know, we know all the roots of it, yeah. you know, you know, because you could drop Tony Conrad's name and all those other guys, Mort Feldman and the other, you know, all those yeah. guys who, they just got it from the Indian music. Yeah. But this is the funny story. I'm in England, probably right near your house. I meet this guy on some public transport and he's a handsome man and he's got a bass and we start talking. I says, oh, you play jazz bass? He goes, yeah. I says, oh yeah. I says, so, so who'd you grow up listening to? You know, Mingus and Dave Holla or, you know, he was dropping all the right names. And I had just heard, um, what's Bella's bass player's name? Um, oh, Victor Wooten. Victor Wooten's uh, tribute album to all the great jazz bass players where he played Bootsy and Marcus. Yeah, he yeah, played yeah. all the hits. And I goes, and I'm not like a v Victor Wooten fan, but it was on my mind. I said, so what do you think of Victor Wooten? He goes, he's a chops player. And so I says, oh, that's interesting because jazz says chops aren't as good. You know, they put it. Right. But then I got home. I'm reading Jerry Douglas in the Wall Street Journal, and they go, so you're like a jazz player. And he goes, nah, I'm a chops player. Uh, that blue, that in, and I mean, you you would be the perfect person. In bluegrass and traditional, chops is a good thing. It's hot, more highly regarded, wouldn't you say? Is that correct? That's funny. I, that you know, Certainly, yeah. Although the funny thing there is, I think people these days think of jazz people as like the most chops. That's like the the heavy... But then right. it's that weird balance. Like if you hear too much of it, it turns people off, you know? Uh, right. Because, yeah. yeah. My friend is, we're doing a, a, a Zoom someday. You should join us on feeling versus chops guitarist. So, you know, Steve Vai and Ingve can play a lot really fast. Right. But then some people think they don't have feeling. Right. But then I can hear something Steve plays once. I go, that's a that's got tons of feeling, but it's yeah. so frilled with all this Paganini wine. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. two notes, dude. Could could you listen to Eddie, you know, Azel just hold a yeah. note? That totally. can, could I breathe between in fact, Alan Holdsworth? I saw him like a few months before he died in Benjamin's. I had to leave because all his other players were like, yeah. and they never let any up. I drove me nuts. And at least when he played, he knew when to stop for a fucking second totally. and let it breathe between. No. Yeah, he'd play beautiful slow lines as well as all his. Yeah. But, but you, you brought up another thing about, I know it was about MF Doom is, it never ends. That's what I think attracted Zappa into saying Alan was his favorite guitarist. Because in the mode that Frank came from, the psychedelic rock guitar solo, you start and you end. Right. Alan never started, never ended. It yeah. just was forever ongoing. It's all the you same know, song. It's, totally. It's, I mean, and it's, a, and it's a, a, a loop, you know. Like I, I it, think it, anything, anything pushed to its farthest, farthest limit can start can actually feel emotional so like alan holdsworth music seems very emotional to me because he's doing yeah. something it's so mathematical and yet it's so extreme that it's almost insane and yeah and, and there's something very moving and strange and powerful in it but at the same yeah. time like bonnie Raitt is probably my favorite living guitarist and you know she's one of those people as well where it's just like one note and you know it just feels incredible Dude, that's beautiful. Cause I, I wish you could meet uh, Elliot Ingberg. He taught her how to play slide guitar. <laughs> you Wait, know, Alice Fingerling. Yeah, you know what? Uh, his name uh, is. Um, yeah, he's the only guy who really ever took a guitar solo on a Beefheart album. Alice in Blunderland. It's on the. It's yeah. on the card you gave me. Oh yeah, I know yeah, it well, man. It was one of the first yeah. things I checked out. Yeah, he taught Lowell, George, and Bonnie how to play slide guitar. Wow. Pretty pretty good for Jewish white blues guitarists. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, so the three T's of music, my friend contends. They 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 relate to Dave Liebman's three tenets. Hand is technique. 
head is theory, both of which you can, you know, learn when you're two years old and get, you know, the technique, you know, the theory, but heart is taste. So he says, te taste, technique, and theory. How do you, you, we know how you can acquire technique and theory. How does one acquire taste? I think that it's just, that's the most, for me, that's the most, the deepest one in a way of all, which is, and it's, and it's through listening and it's through what you encounter and it changes over time. And I think, I don't know how people do it now because there's so much out there. I mean, the beautiful thing of in the previous era was like, you only had the money for however many CDs, right? So our records or whatever they were, or any of these eras. So for me, the beautiful thing of the teenage years was like, you had like 10 CDs. And so you made your own taste by making links in your imagination between them, you know? And now that you can sort of hear everything, I don't know how people, I'm sure the kids will figure out a way to do it, but you know what I mean? So I think it's all well, taste for me is about the eccentric imaginative, the imagination that you make when you hear different kinds of music. Yeah, that's good because most people say taste comes from listening and I understand that, but it's also, you know, I, I think it's I, the imagination through listening. Yeah, I I add, I understand what you're adding the, a more a deeper meaning to oh, wait, this. You mentioned Dave Liebman. I have to tell you a quick Dave Liebman story. So <laughs> in in my early twenties, I was I learned some jazz on the violin just to be able to listen to the music more clearly and and to, you know expand my playing. I never wanted to be a jazz violinist because I hate jazz violin, but I just wanted to learn. That was my, you know, my instrument. So <clears throat> I went to the Jamie Abersold jazz camp and yeah. uh, at the recommend at the behest of Mark Feldman was my teacher. And he's like, you should go. It's a cool camp. You should go. And, and I went and I, and this guy, David Baker was the head teacher there and he was a cello player. And I came in as a fiddle player and he was auditioning the string players to put them in the combos and the people, most of the string players that he would get would be classical musicians who at that time, often didn't have very good sense of rhythm, didn't have very good ear. They played with a lot of vibrato, you know, but had very good theory. Whereas I had a really good ear from playing folk music and I had, you know, a nice rhythm and stuff, even though I was clueless on the theory and jazz side of things. So he really liked me and he put me in his ensemble, which was the top ensemble at the camp. And I mean, I am a terrible jazz musician. Like I have literally no idea how to do it. And here I was with all these like heavy duty, like, you know, right like bebop shredder saxophone players. And he just was like put me in his class for fun. And so Dave Lieben came to the camp and he came to he came to only one class and he came to our class, just like Wittgenstein visiting my grandfather. And right. so he came to our class and he, he was trying to get, these guys would just play like a million notes, right? So right. he was trying to teach people how to play a meaningful solo that actually had an idea that you thought through, right? right? So he goes, we're gonna do an exercise. We're gonna play Stella by Starlight you're gonna play one simple musical idea at the beginning of your solo. And then you're gonna to continue to play only that idea for the whole solo. Doesn't matter how bad your idea is, whatever, just, you know, that's not like the point is to commit to your idea and see it through. Beautiful, right? So Stella by Starlight is a really hard tune and it comes around to my solo and I'm like totally have no idea where we are in the form. And I try and play like something and then I'm gonna repeat it. He stops, he's like, he's like, stop, stop. He stops the whole band. He goes, I know I said it didn't matter how bad your idea is, but that was terrible. Start again. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next tune we played, I was like, I have to redeem myself. The next tune we played was the John Coltrane Impressions, which is basically right. like a D modal fiddle tune. It's basically an Irish fiddle tune. I was like, I got this. And so I just like slayed my fiddle shit over it. And he was like, that was good. <laughs> That's good. Wow. That is a great story. Yeah. Because the, you know, the jet, I, I love how you go. I hate jazz violin. And that's like when Reed was coming up at Swans, I go, you got to listen to Jean Luc Pani plays the music of Frank Zappa. Well, and you know, you got to listen Pani. to, Don, you got to listen to Don Sugarcane Harris, but have you heard Dweezil play the Don Sugarcane Harris solo on guitar? No, I'd love to hear it's that. So amazing because he doesn't hire a violin. He does the Hot Rats album, and all of a sudden, I mean, I have to, I have a problem with playing the album notes like he does. But, he but on a he plays, 
It is. You swear it's Don Sugarcane Harris playing a That's violin. Awesome. Because I got, I got of a badass uh, Don Sugarcane Harris record I have upstairs, a live album from a festival in Europe. It's badass, man. He's oh, yeah. So yeah, great. yeah, yeah. It's real um, raw because look, he's like a look blues up, fiddler. He is a blues figure, but look up Don and Dewey, his first, his first R and B band that Frank's got this great picture of him holding the Don and Dewey album. I'll check that out. Because it's like it's like raw, kind of crazy. R and B, and it was pre him becoming this like blues violinist who, you know, uh, eventually, yeah, he 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 scored by hooking up with Harvey Mandel, who really was the guy who invented finger tapping before Eddie, and well, maybe Frank did it first with a pick, but with your finger, but. Right. Uh, Sam, I asked for 90 minutes and we're at the 90 minute point. Can you go for any longer? I can do you five more minutes and then I'll have to go to bed. But five more, we're okay. good for five more. Okay. Five more minutes, man. I got to cram. How about 10 more? <laughs> ten, ten, 10 more. 10, 10 would be good because I went way off, way off ten, the topic. But ten, this is great. really, yeah, super cool. Thank you so much. And we can, um, so, um, Joseph Boy says, make the secrets productive. Lou Welsh says, guard the secrets, constantly reveal them. But as Thornton Wilder said, art is confession. Art is the secret told. But art is not only the desire to tell one secret, it's the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. You've laid your cards on the table for 90 minutes. I'm honored. <laughs> I'm not insinuating you haven't. What's it really all about for you? What What's art all about or what secrets or what are secrets? When, all when, about? When, when I say it, you put it in the context you want. Like what's it really all about? For oh, you? What's it? Yeah, you can put it into the context. <clears throat> uh, it might sound simple or obvious, but I would say just like the zone, being in the zone. Yeah. No, that's cool. So Moshe Felder, answer. yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great answer. Uh, someone once answered questions with the word vibes. And I was like, that's a good word. Like it's narrowing it down. Word. Yeah. Narrowing it down to a word is fine. In fact, we're going to do the Alan Watts in a second where, okay, let's just do it now. There's five Alan Watts questions just in two great. to four words, each answer. Great. Great. Who started it all? Jimi Hendrix. Ah, that, are we going to make it? Hope so. Where do we put it? Oh, man. I, I, all over the place. Nice. Who's cleaning it up? <laughs> Jimi Hendrix. Nice. Is it serious? Absolutely not. Nice. You know, Frank says, I'm serious about being non-serious. I love it. <laughs> so um, Moshe Feldenkrais works with healing and movement. He says it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength mm. rather than yeah. normally taught to overcome a weakness. Mm. Can you tell us a weakness that you've incorporated to become a strength? <clears throat> Yeah, that's beautiful. And that goes back to what we were saying about all those, you know, Frizzell and all those dudes. The, I think that um, a weakness might, I think that, yeah, I mean, I think that it's just, uh, I think that my all over, just sort of um, lack of focus as a listener, just my kind of all, you know, just, lack of of drive in a particular direction is a listener had became yeah. my became my strength that's beautiful but how did you develop that because did your parents sort of instill that or did you get uh, was that reaction to how they raised you or some well, other they, they they were a good balance because they they were into all I mean, my dad bought me bitches brew like they were into all kind and they loved yeah. you know he loved bar talk and 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 my mom was loved talking heads and you know they loved all different kinds of stuff 
but they were very they were just obsessed with uh you know the folk music stuff so what we had in the house was like folk music and so right. it was very much an adventure of listening with my friend thomas from the popcorn behavior through our teenagers and um and so we we'd really discovered stuff together right you found that was good if you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12 year old, what would you say to your 12 year old self? Oh man, <clears throat> I would say, um, uh, stick to your, you know, I would say play basketball. Don't stop. <laughs> basketball. I what that. I mean is, well, I would say don't stop playing basketball for fun. Because I took a break. I didn't play any b-ball from age 15 to age 38. But, You're kidding. I mean, like once in a while, but basically not. And then, and I played a little in my early 20s, like a teeny bit, but basically, you know, like 15 to 38, I basically didn't play. And then the last two years, it's been the joy of my life. Oh, my God. And so who's your three b-ball player heroes of all time? Man, uh, I mean... When I w it was well, Magic Johnson was my first hero of any kind. Why? Despite being a despite being a Vermonter, it was Magic. He was the dude. I read like five biographies of him when I was ten years old. You know, that and doc that came out with on him a couple years ago was really good. I haven't watched it. I got to do that. That would be great to go yeah. back. And um and I loved Muggsy Bogues also at that age because he was my height. We were both five three at the time, and I got his autobi. I, I got his autograph. I read his autobiography too. And um, otherwise, I'd say um, I'd say uh, Steph Curry, man. Even though he's not my skills, he's just such a beautiful, uh, beautiful shooter. And I love. There's a great Wayne Shorter quote about Steph Curry. You can go dig what? it up. He's sort of talking about how he doesn't really show off on the court. He's sort of, um, you know, he does something like to sort of like even his ease on the court it's just a weird it's beautiful weird wayne shorter quote yeah okay just a couple more thanks sam this has been truly Great. enlightening I've tell me something it. yeah thank you tell me something good you never had and you never want <laughs> something good you never had and you never want man uh 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 for some reason, I thought of contentment, but I don't know why I thought of that because I think of myself as a very content person. But it's what my brain said, so oh, I'm gonna, that's good. I'm gonna stick with first, it. First thought, best thought. That's yeah. good. Contentment is amazing. Yeah, because I think the human condition is uh, conflict, but we don't want to admit it because it 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 it's it, or like you know, oh, I'm gonna be content. So if you were in a vat of vomit up to your neck and someone threw a bag of shit at your face, what would you do? <laughs> I would, uh, I would just, uh, I would, I would wait it out, man. <laughs> wade is a good word. Wade. Wait, yeah, really that's true. That's a multi wade or wade. Wade it out. Wade. With an e or an it. Say it again. With a D E or an it. Wait oh, or wait. wait. Either oh, one. Wait or Either wait. One. Yes. Which one did you say first? A A w A I T. Oh, wait it out, you said uh, first. Uh, oh, A D E is great. Yeah. Um, what's the function of music? Um, it's a dance machine. Yeah. No, that's that's amazing, you know, because they read that Mickey Hart book on music and they, they said it was like a way to communicate, mm, that's you know, they're, they're coming to get us and steal yeah. our food. They play that on the drums or something. True. But I think, I think it is, uh, if you can't say it, sing it. If you can't sing it, dance it, Love you that. know. And, and well, the funny thing is, is that we don't have, we have cave art, but we don't have cave dance and we don't have cave no. music. We have, like you see in that forget, Dream of Forgotten Dream, uh, Cave of yeah. Forgotten Dreams by Herzog, you see that little pipe that the yeah. guy found that's that old. So yeah. it 
could be sounding like that human played it, but we don't know. Maybe he know. played it totally different. Maybe he shredded all kinds of stuff on there. <laughs> <coughs> well, Sam, I really don't want this to end. <laughs> I know, it's so great. I'm trying to milk it, so I'll, I'll close it out with my final two questions, okay. and I really appreciate it. Oh, um, what's, the, what's the healthiest or most impactful cultural shift you see developing today? Beautiful. <clears throat> man, I think that, um, man, I wish I had a sense of this. I think I don't know, but I think that people... I think it's just the fact that despite everything, people still love to, you know, do things in person with each other, to get together, to play music, to, yeah. you know, to, they, despite everything, they still want that. They still love it. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. Um, what gives you the most optimism? Um. Uh, be, I don't know, maybe, um, Jimi Hendrix. Oh my God. I so much agree with you saying him over and over. That was really beautiful. I mean, I find a lot of, you know, memories where I listen to a little audio cassette in my bedroom of a uh, house burning down over and over. Wow. Uh, yeah, amazing human being indeed. And it goes back just to full circle. The first question I ask is, what's the best thing for a human being? And I got it from Wilhelm Reich, who says, the best thing for a human being is another human being. And then the last question is, what gives you the most optimism? That's the question they ask Groucho Marx at the end of his life. And he says, other people. <laughs> uh, right. It's like, it's like uh, you know, he, he spent his life cutting down and making fun of other people. Right. but. It is this thing, my um, my main studies is on why humans invent anything. Like why they invent mm. the fiddle? You know, mm. why did they invent the basketball? Mm. And then how does it shape our behavior? Mm. And, and it wouldn't exist, no invention exists unless there was another person that you would share it with. Like right. would it, would, if we were the, if you're the only person on earth, you still make invention. Exactly. <laughs> Because it's all about this, this some sort of camaraderie or connectedness of putting something yes. in between another person. Absolutely. So even though we we weren't in front of each other, we put this uh, amazing little green dot camera, you yeah. know, <laughs> and it's Thank been God fun. For it this year. With you. Yeah. Thanks again, Sam. That was amazing. Well, I really appreciate you, it, Jerry. It was, it's been a long time. Yeah. Really. I'll be back. I will be, you know, it'll, we'll do it in person next time. I would love it. Beautiful. Do you guys still go up to Swan's Island? We missed the first year last year, you know, because last year. Pandemic. First yeah. Yeah. Wow. Great. That's great. And, and it's me have been going up all this time. Send my love to everybody there next time. I will. And thank you, Clint, for 